Okay, so uh, right now we're at November 17 and I'm lecturing on fiber and lysis platelets. Tomorrow, um, Savior is going to give you quiz 19 and 20. And then you're going to have a Thanksgiving break. And when you get back on Wednesday, uh, no, December 1, I'm going to give you an, another, another review. I'm going to email you a review. And um, that review will cover exam five, which is um, lectures 19 through 22. Okay. So, and you'll get a quiz on, on that Thursday, 21 and 22. So, but I'm going to give you re a review for exam five. It's going to be, it's going to be uh, multiple choice and matching. It's going to be multiple choice and matching. Okay. Now, the following week, because uh, on this day, December 1st, so right now you have, I'm going to teach you the coagulation cascade. I just showed you the fibrinolytic pathway. And then at the end of my review of the coagulation cascade, which I'm going to be discussing um, after Thanksgiving on, on December 1st, is the coagulopathies table. And that's a large table that you need to memorize. So there's three major things that you need to memorize. The co coagulation cascade, the fibrinolytic pathway, and the coagulopathies, in addition to the matching, the matching and uh, multiple choice uh, questions. And that'll be given uh, here. So make sure for next, for December 1st, after the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, make sure you know how to do the coagulation cascade. That's probably the most complicated. Uh, the fibrinolytic system, like I said, I'm going to be giving you a word bank. All you have to do is make sure you put it in the correct place and uh, let me know which one's an activator and which one's an inhibitor. And then the third one, which basically is a table memorization. It's, it's a pretty big table, but if you can figure out the pattern, there are certain patterns, if you, if you know the pattern, then then you can figure out the coagulopathies. Those are big ticket items for points. So make sure, so if you're like borderline A, B, for example, it could make a difference if, if you score pretty well on those three things, the coagulation cascade, fibrinolytic pathway, and the, the coagulopathies table. Okay, so that will be given in exam six. Uh, exam five will just be basic um, multiple choice matching no pathways, but I want you to know the coagulation pass cascade uh, later. I'm going to show that. I'm going to show you how to do it um, in a little bit. Okay, next lecture is platelets. This one is about 41 slides, and uh, it's a little bit more complicated than the uh, fibrinolytic pathway. So, Anything that's megakarya, if you see megakarya anything, you're talking about platelets, okay? Uh, hematopoietic, hematopoietic stem cell forms pre progenitor cells. Uh, the progenitor cells are the cells that produce megakaryocytic series, just like, you know, in, in the last lecture. Once you get to the differentiation portion, then that's when you're, you, you figure out, you have blue eyes, 10 fingers, brown hair, et cetera, okay? So the progenitor cells are committed to produce megakaryocytic series in which the cytoplasm fragments to form circulating platelets. And the formation of the platelets is, is a little interesting. Okay, megakaryocoesis takes place takes place in the bone marrow, okay? Platelets are made in the bone marrow, just like the red blood cells and the white blood cells. They're all made in the bone marrow unless you have extra medullary hematopoiesis. You don't have extra megakaryopoiesis on the outside. It takes place in the bone marrow, okay? It's only the blood elements, the white uh, blood cells and red blood cells. So the cells of the megakaryocytic system or the platelets are unique. Um, in that the nucleus undergoes mitotic divisions. So the cell undergoes mitotic divis div divisions with, within one cytoplasm, one cytoplasm, okay? So one cytoplasm, but the nuclear divisions take place within that one cyto cytoplasm, and it's called endomitosis. 
and I circled it there. Make sure you know that term because you have my my mitosis ha happening, but it's all within one cell or endo reduplication. Okay, endo reduplication. But I think for testing purposes, make sure you know the term endomitosis. Make sure you know the term endomitosis. The result is a polyploid nucleus, a polyploid nucleus, meaning that, you know, you've heard of uh, haploid, diploid. Well, it's polyploid, a lot of nuclei divided within the cytoplasm. Megakaryoblast, that's the first, uh, that's the earliest um, cell form, 20 to 45 micrometers. Usually the, uh, the megakaryocyte is the largest cell in the bone marrow. Okay, but the megakaryoblast is 20 to 45 micrometers, deep blue, fine reticular nucleus, visible nucleoli. You're not going to know how to um, you uh, identify these because it's bone marrow. You won't look at bone marrow preps. That's what it is. Megakaryoblast with nucleoli. It's large. Um, those are probably nucleated red blood cells, and you see bands there. But this is probably a megakaryoblast. That's for pathologists to identify. Megakaryopoiesis, okay. Next stage is promegakaryocyte. Uh, first site of lobulation, it's the developmental stage. And then the third stage is the megakaryocyte. The megakaryocyte is large, 30 to 100 micrometers. Clumped and lobulated nucleus, color is pinkish purple cytoplasm. So the mission of the megakaryocyte is to proliferate, then fragment their cytoplasm into platelets. So what happens is, this is a megakaryocyte, and this is the cytoplasm. So what happens is, as the cytoplasm is sloughing off, they're sloughing off of the cytoplasm here. What that sloughing off is, those are the platelets that are ready to be, um, to enter the circulatory system. So here it is, uh, remember the endomitosis that takes place here? So you got endomitosis within one cell, and then once it becomes uh, mature, then you're going to get sloughing off of the platelets on the edge. Okay, they'll be released. They'll they'll say, "I'm ready to go. I'm ready to fly away," and uh, it you know be circulating in your blood as platelets. This is where your platelets come from. It comes from this megakaryocyte. It's kind of like the nurse cell. It's kind of like the nurse cell because they develop. This is the mothership, and its little babies are being released uh, into the blood. Megakaryocyte, the largest cell in the bone marrow. All right, platelets or thrombocyte. These are the cytoplasmic fragments, remember, that are released from the megakaryocyte. That's what, what's broken off from the megakaryocyte. 30% of the pla platelets are sequestered by the spleen. So you have a lot of platelets in your blood, but just because they're sequestered or taken up by the captured by the spleen, it doesn't mean anything. You always have platelets. Uh, and then 70% of your platelets are circulating in your blood. The lifespan of the platelets is short-lived. It's seven to 10 days. Make sure you know that the lifespan of a platelet is seven to 10 days. And they're the smallest formed element, two to four micrometers, two to four micrometers, seven to 10 days. Platelet functions, okay. Um, Provides negatively charged phospholipid surface to, for factor 10 and prothrombin activation. Prothrombin activation. The platelets release substances that mediate vasoconstriction. So vasoconstriction. So remember when you got an injury and you have vasoconstriction going on? Well, part of that, part of the reason for the vasoconstriction is the platelets, okay, releasing substances. Platelet aggregation, platelet aggregation is important too because platelets need to, to aggregate and become sticky. Remember when you have an injury, the platelets will undergo changes. It'll change in shape and it will become sticky. So those are the changes that take place when you have an injury. So platelet aggregations and coagulation, the coagulation are the factors. So it, um, the platelet factors will facilitate the coagulation, the coagulation clotting factors, thrombin generation, and vascular repair. So the surface membrane glycoproteins, and this is on the surface of the platelets. So you got glycoprotein 2B and 
glycoprotein 3A attached to other platelets. So this is how the platelet adhesion takes place, the stickiness. It's uh, glycoprotein 2B and glycoprotein 3A attached to other platelets via fibrinogen. And glycoprotein 1B will bind to collagen and subendothelial via von Willebrand's factor. If you can recall, uh, von Willebrand's factor is that factor that's uh, always bound to factor eight. It's always a complex, eight colon VWF, okay? The platelet structure, there are three zones in the platelets, the peripheral zone, the sol gel zone, and the organelle zone. The peripheral zone consists of a glycocalyx. It's the exterior, it's the outer part of the platelets or the platelet membrane. So on the surface of the platelets is an open canalicular system where there's communication between the inside of the platelet and the outside of the platelet and a submembranous uh, area of specialized microfilaments. So there's an open canalicular system. The platelet membrane, okay, consists of re receptors. So it's important to be very familiar with these receptors because a lot of times when a patient has platelet problems, the doctor will order tests that have these names on them, ADP, thrombin, epinephrine, collagen, thromboxane A2, and serotonin. So if he's looking to see if the platelets are functioning properly, because these are the receptors, the platelet receptors, ADP, thrombin, epinephrine, collagen, thromboxane A2, okay, it's a pretty, neat, pretty unique name, and serotonin. Those are your receptors that are on the platelet membrane. ADP and thromboxane A2, these are potent platelet aggregators when bound to receptors. Again, aggregators meaning that they're responsible for the stickiness of the platelets. And it's released during platelet activation in response to thrombin. Okay, so thrombin is part of the coagulation cascade. So you can see how the, the platelets, the aggregation and um, uh, the aggregation of the platelets are work in conjunction with the coagulation cascade because it's like this one here, uh, ADP and thromboxin A2 are released during platelet act aggregation in response to thrombin, okay? In response to thrombin. And I'll show you where thrombin is on the coagulation cascade. And the platelet membrane, this is also part of the peripheral zone and contains phospholipid component. So activated platelets, like I said, when there's an injury, the platelets become activated. When they become activated, they change in shape and they also become sticky and exposed platelet membrane, phospholipids, okay? All of these take place and it all contributes to the stickiness and the aggregation, aggregation meaning that they know, they know to aggregate at the site of injury, okay? The salt gel zone, as opposed, that's a middle zone, is uh, the cytoskeleton and used to describe the salt gel zone. And it, what it consists of microtubules, microfilaments, and some membranous um, filaments. So it's the middle zone of the platelets. And then finally, the organelle zone. The organelles are responsible for, that's where all the metabolic activities of the platelets take place. Now, even though it's, these are metabolic activities, Platelets do not have nuclei. Okay, make sure you know and remember that. Platelets do not have nuclei, just like red blood cells. So platelets are anucleate, anucleate, and do not possess either a Golgi body or rough endoplasmic reticulum. So having said that, that means protein synthesis. There's no protein synthesis going on. So the most numerous organelles that um, are the platelet granules. So <clears throat> they don't have nuclei, but what the platelet have are granules, okay? Three types of granules. Uh, these are storage granules. You got the dense granules, the alpha granules, and the lysosomes. So the dense granules are smaller than the alpha granules. So the alpha granules are the main ones. I probably should have started with alpha, but the dense granules are smaller than the alpha granules. And they store ADP and ATP, ionic calcium, serotonin, and phosphates. So that's what's in the dense granules. The alpha granules are the most numerous, and they contain platelet-specific proteins and plasma proteins. So the most numerous are the alpha granules, 
a little smaller than alpha granules or the dense granules. And then the third type of granules are the ones that are, have the enzymes. Those are the lysosomes, contain microbiocidal enzymes, neutral, neutral proteases, and acid hydrolases. So those are the three types of storage granules and platelets. There's a condition, there's a condition where um, I think I think I'll talk about that in in um, lecture next time. It's called gray platelet syndrome. Well, gray platelet syndrome is where the platelets look like they're gray. Well, they're gray because they don't have any any granules. Okay, so that's a that's a deficiency. That's a condition. Uh, it's called gray platelet syndrome. Glycogen, uh, glycogen granules function in platelet metabolism. Glycogen is like starch and it's a source of energy. Serotonin pr promotes the recruitment of additional platelets. So serotonin will uh, help bring in other platelets to the site of injury to, to the platelet aggregate at the site of injury. So serotonin will, it's kind of like cytokines, you know, cytokines tell the cells to go to the site of injury. Well, serotonin will re promote the recruitment of additional platelets to the site of injury. Serotonin will tell the platelets, there's the injury, go aggregate over there. Okay, so serotonin is kind of like cytokines. Uh, ATP is produced uh, by the oxidative Krebs cycle and glycolysis. So ATP is, as you know, is um, your energy source, your source of energy. And then the dense tubular system is derived from smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the side of prostaglandin and thromboxane uh, synthesis. So those are two things that the doctors may uh, order. Those are uh, two tests if they question platelet function. And the dense tubular system, what it does, it sequesters calcium, it takes up calcium. And the release of calcium from the dense tubular system that triggers platelet contraction and platelet aggregation. So it all works together for platelet contraction and platelet act activation. So here's, here's an illustration here. You got constriction here. Constriction here because that's what, you know, the platelets are responsible for constricting the blood vessels. But here you got a release of chemicals and these chemicals are ADP, thromboxane A2, calcium ions, and platelet and platelet factors. Okay, they are remember, and then the serotonin will tell the platelets to aggregate over here. So this is what happens at the site of injury. You get constriction here, and then you got your platelets and all of these chemicals working to get all these platelets to become sticky, the adhesion, the aggregation. Okay, all of that takes place at the site of injury. So when the fibrin forms, when the fibrin forms, then um, this will relax into, into this and um, excess fibrin will be taken up by fibrin, fibrin by plasmin and macrophages, like I mentioned in the last lecture. Okay, granule release, granule release of the platelets, contents of dense bodies and alpha granules are released. And what this does when the granules are released, this facilitates and regulates clot formation. So the platelets are now working uh, with the coagulation cascade. So it facilitates and regulates clot formation. So when I say clot formation, we're talking about the coagulation cascade. So you, you know you got two, two processes going on. It's the platelet aggregation and the stickiness and the platelets arriving at the site of injury. That's one process. The other process is the clot formation. So the platelets and the clotting factors both work together, okay? to um, to prevent you from bleeding to death. So the platelets will here will adhere to other platelets. Stabilization of the clot. So stabilization of the clot, coagulation factors interact with phospholipids. So where do the phospholipids come from? Phospholipids come from the surface of the platelets. So again, you have the platelets working together with the coagulation cascade. Next test is called the bleeding time test. The bleeding time test is a measure of platelet function. So what that means is you have, if you have an adequate number of platelets and you have a normal bleeding time, and usually it's like three to nine minutes, I'll, I'll tell you what that is uh, later on. But um, 
normal bleeding time means you have you have a um, a calibrated blade, not a calibrated, but a, a standard blade that's used to make a cut in your arm, and um, and then your hand, your arm needs to be. Um, uh, you need to use a blood pressure cuff to maintain standard pressure. And the standard pressure on the blood pressure cuff is 40 millimeters. So you crank it up to 40 and you keep it at 40. Okay, so you have standard blood flow, standard um, pressure on your arm, 40 millimeters of mercury. And then you make a standard incision. And it's usually, a, it's called a simplate device. And what it does, it uh, these blades pop out real quick and retract and it makes uh, incision in your hand, in your arm. And what you do is you wipe off the first blood and then you start your timer and you, you um, time, you measure how long it takes to stop bleeding. And that's called the bleeding time, okay? So you're measuring the amount of time it takes for the clot formation and the platelets and the coagulation factors and the white thrombus or in the red thrombus to, to form and to stop bleeding. And as soon as you stop bleeding, you stop your timer and that's your bleeding time. So there it is, you make your standard cuts, you put on a blood pressure cup up to 40, uh, 40 millimeters of mercury. You make your cuts, wipe the first blood away and then measure the time it takes to form your clot or stop bleeding. And that's the device that they put on your arm. Blades will come out uh, and make incisions, standard incision, uh, and it has a standard depth. And um, you blot it. You take out. You take away the excess blood by by creeping up from the side. You take away the excess blood so that you can continue bleeding, so that the excess blood will not interfere with the bleeding. You never go down from the top. You always creep up by the side. Hopefully. Um, this used to be a test where it's only the CLSs can do. And I don't know if they've opened up the MLTs, but, um, but this is the bleeding time test. Again, you creep up from the side to take away the excess blood and your timer is going. So as soon as you stop seeing blood uh, formation, uh, they use a, that circular filter paper. So when you creep up and you don't see any blood um, being taken up by the filter paper, then, um, you stop your stopwatch and that's your bleeding time. Uh, so normally it's done on the ear. I mean, normally it's done on the, uh, the arm like that, but it also can also be done on the ear, on the earlobe, okay? You can do a bleeding time on your earlobe. Well, other tests for platelet function are the clot retraction. So basically for platelet function, it's the bleeding time test. Um, the clot retraction test is another um, platelet function test, and this is an easy one. So you you draw blood, and what you do is you just wait for it to clot, and you have to see if the clot will pull away from the surface of the test tube. Okay, if it doesn't pull away from the test tube, it means that um, you probably have a platelet problem. It's a very very easy test. All you do is is draw blood and and watch watch the tube. Okay. Uh, platelet factor three availability. Platelets provide circuit surface for coagulation factor activation. Um, if platelet factor three is not available, then the clotting time will be prolonged. The clotting time of this clot retraction test. Okay, aspirin. Aspirin. Um, you know, sometimes if you're going to have a surgical procedure or Maybe uh, your dentist will ask you, have, have you taken aspirin recently? Aspirin will um, uh, inhibit, inhibit the platelet, platelets. It, it prevents platelet aggregation. So if you don't have platelet aggregation, then it can cause you to um, have excessive bleeding, okay? Aspirin prevents aggregation by inhibiting the activity of the enzyme cyclooxygenase. So if you see on a board exam, and I think I remember even seeing this on my board exam, if you see the enzyme cyclooxygenase, the only, the only purpose of this enzyme cyclooxygenase is, for, is on the action of aspirin because um, aspirin will inhibit cyclooxygenase, platelet aggregation, all right? 
So aspirin, you don't want to take aspirin because aspirin will uh, cause you to continue to bleed a lot after a procedure. Thrombocytopenia, you know what that is. It's low platelet count, um, low below 50. That's actual, actually a critical value depending on the lab where you're working at. And you know that thrombocytopenia is seen in leukemias, uh, marrow aplasia, remember aplasia, aplastic anemia, uh, low platelet count, megaloblastic anemias, the vitamin B12 folic acid deficiency, and may heglin anomaly. I'll talk about may heglin anomaly next uh, in two weeks. TTP. TTP is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Um, whenever you get purpura, what that means is, is bruising in your legs and these dark blotches. Whenever you see in a case study, if a patient has um, bruising, it's, it's bruising in your legs especially, and that means you probably have a platelet problem, a platelet problem. So TTP is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Platelet autoantibodies of unknown origin, okay? Autoantibodies. So you have autoantibodies. What it's doing is it's, it's destroying platelets, your own platelets. It's an autoantibody. Spontaneous remission within several weeks. That means you'll recover from it. Treatment are steroids, uh, splenectomy, and platelet transfusion is, is not, that will not work. It's ineffective, okay? So you treat with steroids or a splenectomy. And it's when you have um, platelet autoantibodies. You, you have it, but it goes away. It'll uh, go into remission after several weeks. And this is what it looks like, uh, purpura. Laboratory evaluation of TTP, thrombotic thyrosine, thrombocytopenic purpura is obviously uh, thrombocytopenic, a low platelet count, okay? And it's due to the destruction, the autoantibodies. Your bleeding time is prolonged because you don't have any platelets. Uh, tourniquet test is positive. What the tourniquet test is, and it's also a platelet function test, is you you put on you you tie a tourniquet to your arm, and you don't want to tighten it too tight. But what you do is you leave the tourniquet on for a long time. And when you if you leave the tourniquet on for a long time, and you see petechiae, remember petechiae, those red spots. If you see red spots forming and that's a positive test. That's a positive tourniquet test. Okay, that's positive for TTP. And clot, clot retraction is poor. Again, you draw the blood into the tube, and if the clot does not pull away from the glass inside the tube, that, then the clot retraction is said to be poor. And that's what petechiae look like, these red spots. You know what they are. Uh, I think it was the lymphocyte lecture that talked about petechiae. And then you have secondary immune thrombocytopenia. It's also an autoimmune disorder or drug ingestion may cause antibodies. So uh, this is also uh, secondary immune. So it involves antibodies again, and it's autoimmune antibodies. The treatment is steroids and plasmapheresis. Okay. Laboratory evaluation of secondary immune thrombocytopenia is, of course, decreased platelet count, prolonged bleeding time, that would be those two would be expected, and marrow positive marrow aspiration normal to increase number of megakaryocytes. So you'll see a large number of marrow, uh, megakaryocytes, which is interesting because on the peripheral side you'll see a low platelet count. Okay, so those two things uh, don't go hand in hand. You have a low platelet count on the peripheral side, but in the platelets you have a lot of megakaryocytes. The factory is full of workers, but they're not producing platelets. DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. Okay, so thromboplastin-like substances um, are released into the peripheral blood, initiating a clot. So that's what happens. You have clots being formed in your peripheral blood spontaneously. So thromboplastin-like substances are released into the peripheral blood. And when that happens, it's going to initiate the formation of a clot. The, plate, the platelets reutil, um, are reutilized by clots and diffuse generation of fibrin and thrombin consuming factors in platelets, okay? So the platelet factors are consumed. When the, when, the pla when the factors are said to be consumed, that means the coagulation cascade has gone into, has gone to completion because all the factors are now used to form 
to create a vibrant clot. That's what, when, when I use the term, or when you hear the term, the platelets are, con are consumed, then their platelets are consumed to be used up to form a fibrin clot. Okay, diffuse generation of fibrin and thrombin consuming factors and platelets. So uh, deficiency in glycoprotein components, laboratory value. Oh. Okay, um, bernard Soulier syndrome. This is a platelet disorder. Uh, bernard Soulier syndrome is a, is, uh, can cause gland, what's called Glanzmann thrombasthenia. It's a deficient of glycoprotein components, laboratory evaluation. You have a normal platelet count, right? So you have a normal platelet count, but the bleeding time is prolonged. So if you have a normal platelet count, so your platelet count is 340,000, but your bleeding time is like 15 minutes. So your platelets were not working. So it's a, remember the bleeding time test is a platelet function test and the, the bleeding time is prolonged, then uh, your platelets are not functioning properly. And when you compare it to the, your platelet count, if it's within the normal range of 140 to 440, then something's going on with your platelets. They're not functioning properly. And one of the considerations is Glanzmann's thrombasthenia. Clot retraction is poor, and that would be expected with uh, poorly functioning platelets, and platelet retention is abnormal. Another sy uh, syndrome is bernard Soulier syndrome. bernard Soulier syndrome is glycoprotein 1B deficiency uh, that's necessary for normal interaction between platelets and von Willebrand's factor. So that's missing, uh, glycoprotein 1B deficiency, okay? So it's necessary for the interaction of platelets and von Willebrand's factor. You're missing glycoprotein 1B. Um, bernard Soulier syndrome, continuing on, is a giant platelet disorder. I don't know if in, in the laboratory, if Sabre will be asking to look at, I think, giant platelets. Actually, when I was a student and I was on the bench, giant platelets was actually, the term was giant bizarre platelets. So you have platelets, you have large platelets, and then you have giant platelets. But when I was on the bench, we called them giant bizarre platelets. So giant platelets are platelets that are almost the size of red blood cells. A large platelets are the size of a small platelet, small normal platelet, and the size of a red cell. Those are large platelets. And then giant platelets is almost the size of a red blood cell. And these, uh, in bernard Soulier syndrome, they typically have large platelets. Uh, but in the peripheral blood, you have a low platelet count, thrombocytopenia. And again, in the bone marrow, uh, it doesn't make sense because you have a lot of megakaryocytes, a lot of workers in the factory, but they're not producing platelets, thrombocytopenia. And uh, symptoms of bernard Soulier syndrome, perioperative, postoperative, bleeding. Uh, you have bleeding, bleeding gums. Remember gingival hypertrophy uh, from the acute leukemias. Remember that M5, Acute monocytic leukemia has bleeding gums or a gingival hypertrophy. Easy bruising. Whenever you have bruising in your legs or any kind of bruising, your first suspicion would be that person might have a platelet problem. Uh, heavy, menstrual, heavy menstrual periods, nosebleeds, epistaxis uh, is another symptom of bernard Soulier syndrome and prolonged bleeding from small injuries. So you scratch yourself, you, you would bleed and you would think that you stopped bleeding but you're still bleeding. So again, that would be like the bleeding, prolonged bleeding time test. And that's it for platelets. Are there any questions? No questions? Okay. So the next thing I will do is I'll close this out. Is I'm going to go over the coagulation cascade. Okay, and I'm going to send this to you. So on the coagulation cascade, what I want you to do, the four numbers that you need to memorize, 12, 11, 9, and 10. Okay. The coagulation, the four, you just, you need to remember 12, 11, 9, 10. If I was in the laboratory and I was going to do this on the board at the beginning of lecture, I would say, remember these numbers, 12, 11, 9, and 10. Okay, 12, 11, 9, and 10. So you have 12, 11, 9, and 10. What you do is 
This is the first thing you do on a blank piece of paper, 12, 11, 9, 10. And you write it down in an angle like this, 12, 11, 9, 10. 12 will go to 12A. 11 will go to 11A. 9 will go to 9A. 10 will go to 10A. Okay. So that's easy. The, the, these four factors, these are the factors that are circulating in your blood. No activation, no injury yet. When injury takes place, they become activated. So 12A, 11A, 9A, and 10A. So remember, 12, 11, 9, 10. 10 will, go, will be activated to 10A, and 10 will be activated to 10A. So this is the intrinsic side, and this is the extrinsic side. So here, remember the extrinsic side is only factor seven. Factor seven will go to 7A, okay? And 7A will go, will catalyze this, uh, the reaction of 10 going to 10A. So 12A will catalyze 11 to 11A, 11A will catalyze 9 to 9A, and 9A will catalyze 10 to 10A. So you bring these arrows down, okay? like that, 7A will catalyze 10 to 10A. So this is the first thing that you do. You remember 12, 11, 9, 10 goes to 12A, 11A, 9A, and 10A. And then 10 goes to 10A, and this is the extrinsic side, seven going to 7A, okay? And they all go down. Then the next thing is starting with, not right here, nine, okay? because I'm gonna be inserting uh, another reaction because nine going to 9A, right? And then 10 going to 10A, 10 going to 10A. So you have, um, for the 9A coming down, you have eight going to 8A and the catalyze, 8A will catalyze this reaction. And then here, five go to 5A and 5A will catalyze 10A going to this reaction, okay? So, 8A will catalyze this reaction, and then 8 to 8A, and then 5 to 5A. And this reaction here, 10A will catalyze prothrombin to thrombin. Okay, it will catalyze prothrombin to thrombin. Okay, so now starting off with prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin, and this is a common mistake, is that when you branch, you, this branch coming off here, they would put it here in this reaction, but it, make sure you don't do that. It comes off of thrombin. Don't start off here, the, uh, the arrow come, coming down here. The arrow comes down from thrombin. So thrombin will break off will into, two, into two areas and thrombin will catalyze fibrinogen going to fibrin monomer and thrombin will catalyze 13 going to 13A, okay? So thrombin will branch off and catalyze fibrinogen to fibrin monomer, and thrombin will branch off 13 to 13A, okay? Okay, so 13A, and you got your fibrin monomer and 13A. So that's coming from here, fibrin monomer and 13A. Fibrin, fibrinogen going to fibrin monomer and 13 going to 13A. So you have fibrin monomer is catalyzed by 13A. So the 13A, the 13 going to 13A, the 13A will catalyze fibrin monomer to uh, cross-link fibrin polymer. So fibrin monomer will go to cross-link fibrin monomer, and this is now your fibrin clot, okay? So did you see that? So you start off with the intrinsic and extrinsic system. Just make sure you know 12, 11, 9, 10. You go to the activated factors, 12, 11, 9, 10, and then arrow down, arrow down, arrow down to catalyze those reactions. Uh, 10 going to 10A, 7 going to 7A, and that will arrow down to the 10 to 10A reaction. Okay, so this is intrinsic, extrinsic. And then with uh, factor nine, you in, now you're gonna insert eight going to 8A, and that will catalyze nine going down. And then five to 5A will catalyze 10A going down and going down to prothrombin to thrombin, okay? So this slide will illustrate, illustrate where eight factors eight and factors five go. And um, now you're, you stop at prothrombin to thrombin. 
So what, the next thing will happen is you're branching off a of thrombin now. Thrombin will branch off to, to catalyze fibrinogen to fibrin monomer. And thrombin will also branch off to catalyze 13 to 13A. So now you have fibrin monomer and 13A. Fibrin monomer and 13A. This 13A will catalyze the fibrin monomer going to cross-link fibrin polymer. And this cross-link fibrin polymer is now your fibrin clot. And this is the cascade. 12, 11, 9, 10, uh, 8 going to 8A, catalyzing 9A, and 5 going to 5A, catalyzing 10A, and 7 going to 7A, going down to 10 to 10A, prothrombin going to thrombin, thrombin branching off to catalyze fibrinogen to fibrin monomer, thrombin branching off to catalyze 13 to 13A, 13A, then fibrin monomer will go to uh, cross-link fibrin polymer, and this 13A will catalyze that reaction. And this crossing fibrin polymer is your fibrin clot. So in two weeks, next, you know, not next Wednesday, obviously, because it's a holiday, uh, but the week after, I'd like for you guys to memorize this and I'll see how you did. How you did. Because I'm going to add more reactions to this. I'm going to add more components to this because you need to know where calcium plays, plays a role. And you also need to know where uh, pre-calocrine and calocrine go and high molecular weight uh, kininogen because those are also part of the coagulation cascade, but I need to insert those. And I'll, I'll tell those to you um, in two weeks on Wednesday. Okay, so that's the coagulation cascade. Hopefully I broke it down into a simple way. Just remember 12, 11, 9, 10, intrinsic, extrinsic, your, your factor 8A and your 5A, your thrombin branching off the fibrin engine, the fibrin in 13 and 13A, and um, fibrin monomer going to your clot in 13A, catalyzing that to form your fibrin clot, okay? The next thing I'm gonna show you is this. This is the table I was telling you about. You need to memorize this. It looks pretty intimidating, but if you can figure, you will give in, these headers up above, and you'll be given these factors down on the side. So what will happen is you'll be getting a, a sheet just like this. And all this area here, you will need to fill in the blanks. So basically, this is just a straight memorization. So I'm going to send this um, PowerPoint presentation to you. I, get, I gave you a blank sheet so you can print this how many times, and you can practice filling it in. Okay, you can practice filling it in. And what these are, are um, um, the coagulopathies. You know, the bleeding time is abnormal. Pro time is abnormal or normal. PT is normal or abnormal. And thrombin time, normal and abnormal. Okay, so these are the coagulopathies based on these factors here. Okay. So with fibrinogen deficiency, this is, these are the results of the test. These are factor deficiencies. So factor five deficiency, these results are what you will be getting as for, uh, when you have a factor five deficiency. These are the test results. So this table, you have to memorize it. Uh, every, every class that I've, I've taught hematology, this, this table was memorized and I've given you a blank so that you can practice. So make sure by next Wednesday, hopefully, you, you've done this a couple of times, and I'll be asking you to see how you did. So make sure you know this by way of this right here. So I tried to simplify it. I tried to break it down, and hopefully, it's it's I simplified it, and this is what you'll get. And then the, um, the coagulopathies, factor deficiencies, and I gave you a worksheet to work with. So I'll, go, I'll be sending this to you so you, that you have... Um, something to do over the, the, the Thanksgiving holiday. Are there any questions before I go over the quiz review? Any questions? None, okay. All right, so
Okay. So, um, hmm. quiz 19 is coagulation testing. Make sure, you know, when you review, okay, so the quizzes are going to be on, on the lecture. So it's going to be the quiz tomorrow. This is the quiz tomorrow, right? Yeah, quiz tomorrow will be on lecture 19 and lecture 20. Lecture 19 and lecture 20 on the two lectures that I did last week. So when you prepare for these quizzes, when you study for these quizzes, make sure that you study the PowerPoints. Make sure you study the PowerPoints, especially the red. Make sure you understand what's going on. And whenever I do the review, make sure you take notes on my review, okay? I mean, as if a lot of times when I, when I grade your quizzes and I see that you guys got a, somebody gets a question that, you know what, I know, I know I covered that during the review, review and I still got it wrong. So either you're not, uh, either you're not understanding the concept or you're not listening to the, um, the the recorded lecture. The recorded lecture has everything that I talked about, okay? Everything that I talked about, and if I say it's going to be on the quiz, it's going to be on the quiz. So it's I'm only saying that to help you guys out. Okay, um, extrinsic factor, you know, the factors of the extrinsic pathways. Anybody remember? Is it 12, 11, 9, and 10? Um, that's on the other side. Oh, I'm sorry, that's, that would be 7. I'm sorry, I got it backwards there. 7. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, that would be 7. And then uh, what about the vitamin K dependent factors? 2, 7, 9, and 10. Yes, make sure you know 2, 7, 9, and 10. Uh, Okay, uh, remember inpatient versus outpatient? What anticoagulation is um, given to patients who are outpatients? Either Coumadin or heparin for outpatients. What anticoagulant? So if they have uh, heart surgery or whatever, and the doctor says, I need to keep you on anticoagulants and um, I'm you're going to be discharged from the hospital. What anticoagulant will they usually give the patient on an outpatient basis? You know what the outpatient anticoagulant is? Coumadin. Coumadin, right. If you think about in the ICU, they give heparin drips. If you think about heparin drips in the ICU, um, obviously inpatient. So it's either going to be Coumadin or it's going to be heparin. So heparin is inpatient and Coumadin is outpatient, okay? Um, and what is the term, what is the test that is used to standardize the protein? So the doctor wants to monitor his anticoagulant therapy and... Uh, so he's given Coumadin. So the test for Coumadin is, is which pathway? That's the extrinsic pathway, which is factor seven, correct? So extrinsic pathway, the test that will uh, monitor the extrinsic pathway is usually the protein. So rather than running a protein from laboratory to laboratory because they're not standardized, what tests will the doctor request? instead of the prothrombin time for standardization. The INR. Yes, it's the INR. The doctor will not order a protein. Doctor will order an INR test. Okay, so remember the, remember the, um, the preferred ranges, the optimal ranges for the INR. There are three different ones. Make sure you know, um, the situations, like for example, um, what range will uh, it, will the doctor be targeting for? Like, um, if the patient had a thromboembolism, okay, for example, that's a certain range, or a systemic embolism, that's a certain range, or if the patient had a total knee replacement, um, what's what is the target INR range? 
that they're looking at. So make sure you know the different ranges and the different situations, okay? I'm telling you, make sure you know that. Make sure you know those ranges. Um, very high intensity therapy, that's another range. Make sure you know what that range is. Okay, so you know that you know the um um intrinsic factors. Plasma has in uh contains intrinsic factors. Except for what? Uh there are two components that are not um in plasma intrinsic factors. Calcium and platelets. Yeah, very good. Calcium and platelets. Okay. Okay. Um, can you name a condition where fibrinogen, uh, elevated fibrinogen is noted? Pregnancy? Like near. Pregnancy. Um, what were you going to say? Like near delivery time. <laughs> Pregnancy. Pregnancy is, is enough. Whether it's near delivery, barely pregnant, or in the middle of pregnancy, pregnancy is enough to be um, elevated fibrinogen. Okay, I talked about this today. It's a small protein fragment that's present in the blood after the blood clot is degraded by fibrinolysis. Is it, is it D-dimer, fibrin, fibrin degradation product, uh, thrombin, or insoluble fibrin? It's been degraded. The fibrin degradation product. Right. Uh, another good guess would be D-dimer, but that would be, D-dimer is proteolytic degradation. D-dimer is proteolytic, but... Um, the first degradation uh, product is fibrin degradation product. Okay, so remember the picture of that leg and the accumulation of the, of the um, platelet. What is that thing that broke up that can end up in your lung? Embolus. It's called an embolus, okay. Okay, so if... if um, You spontaneously clot throughout your circulatory system. What condition is that? DIC. Yes, that's DIC. And do you remember what leukemia causes DIC? Acute promyelocytic? Yes, or M3. M3. You knew that, right? Of course you did. Okay, so uh, I don't. I don't. I think I went over this term. But when you have DIC, can come from uh, burns and uh, remember I talked about burns and electro electrocution, uh, the breakdown of, of muscle tissue. Did I go over? I think I went over this term, and the term is defined in your lecture: rhabdomyolysis. What is rhabdomyolysis? It's the breakdown of, you remember that? Remember what that was? Breakdown of muscle tissue. Yeah. Okay. Okay, DIC can be treated, right? So that's why, and you treat it with, like I mentioned today, TPA, correct? So uh, if you don't treat it, if you don't treat it, um, well, even though you do treat it, if you have DIC, is the prognosis good or bad? Bad. Yeah, DIC, no matter what, if it's, if it's even if you treat it, usually with TPA, it's not usually uh, a good thing.
Okay, know what the know what the um, the thrombin time test is. What what reaction it it involves, and that's usually fibrinogen to fibrin. Um, so one of the tests for DIC is um, name a test for the DIC. I know you you can have. Uh, Normally for DIC, it's a PT, PTT, fibrinogen, and a CBC. But what, what other coag test is important for diagnosing C, uh, uh, DIC? D-dimer? Yes, it's D-dimer. And wow, it looks like this test is, okay. And then you know this, I hope you guys were listening today. That what's the main enzyme of fibrinolysis? Plasmin. Okay, good. And um, I think I went over this. Um, DVT. What are some things? What are the ca some causes of DVTs? Deep vein thrombosis. There is a list I remember in the lecture last time um, that caused deep vein thrombosis or um, yeah, that caused the deep vein thrombosis. Do you remember what some of them are or a couple? Sitting for long periods of time? Yeah, usually. And the example that I used was um, this lady went to India, she was diabetic and she just sat in her seat. She didn't get up and walk around. That's why it's always good when you're, when you're taking a long flight to get up and stretch your legs and get your legs circulating. So long flights and What's another, what's another condition that can cause DVT? It's a common one. I don't want to scare any, anybody. Pregnancy. Pregnancy can cause DVT. Something to be, be careful with. All right. And then... Okay. Make sure you know the alternate names. Okay, like Christmas factor and labile factor. Remember those? Okay, what's going on here? All right. And this is on coagulation terms. Make sure you know the four systems that maintain hemostasis. The four systems that maintain hemostasis. You remember what they are? You got two of them. You know, you know two of them, the, the two pathways. What are the, the two pathways? You know the two big pathways that you need to memorize? What are the two big pathways you need to memorize? Coagulation. Okay, that coagulation in the fibrinolytic. So that's two. What are the other two systems that maintain hemostasis? Vascular, Vascular system, system and platelets. Okay, vascular system and platelets. So if you're reading from your notes, that's a good thing, okay? And the delicate balance between clotting and, and chopping up your fibrin is called what? 
between coagulation and fibrinolysis, that delicate balance is called something. Hemostasis. Right, hemostasis. Okay, so when you have throm uh, thrombosis, what is another name for thrombosis? Formation clot? of a clot, correct. Okay. Know all the things that happen when an injury occurs. I talked about that a lot today. Mm, let me see. Okay. What happens to platelets when the injury happens? What happens to platelets? So a lot of this that I talked about last time was talked about again today. What happens to the platelets when you cut yourself? They go to the site of the cut. Yeah, what, what happens to them individually? Right, they go to the site, that's one thing. But what happens to them individually? Go ahead. They become sticky. They can become sticky and, and also too, they become sticky and what else, what happens to their shape? They change the shape as well. Change shape. And then after the platelets arrive, what happens next? What what's what's formed to help out the platelets? Clot. The, a clot, yeah, but there's a more descriptive term. It's, a platelet plug. Plug. it's called the fibrin mesh, right? It's fiber, like a net. It's a, a net that covers the platelet. So it's a fibrin mesh. So the what is basically a clot is the fibrin mesh that it's it's the a clot is basically what? It, what two components? What makes up a clot? Fibrin and platelets. Correct, fibrin and platelet. Pretty basic. So you know how anticoagulants use, uh, how anticoagulants work, right? Like EDTA, lithium, uh, heparin, and sodium citrate. What, what are you removing uh, from the from the blood so it doesn't clot? Calcium. Calcium. Okay, make sure you know the factors of the intrinsic pathway. I think, Rudy, you mentioned that earlier. Remember, you remember the fact factors? Yes, 12, 11, 9, and 10. 12, 11, 12, 11, 9, and how about 12, 11, 9, and 8? You might want to check your notes on that. I have 12, 11, 9, and 8. Put an asterisk by that and make sure you verify that. What about the extrinsic pathway? That's an easy one. Seven. Very good. Uh, okay. Make sure you know what activates both the intrinsic fact, uh, intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. Okay. The intrinsic pathway is activated by um, what factor? Platelet factor. Right. And the extrinsic pathway is activated by? The tissue factor. Tissue. Tissue factor. What's another name for factor four? I thought I heard it. Calcium. Calcium. Okay, labile factor. What's another name for labile factor? Proaxillary or factor five? 
uh, label factor is factor five. Uh huh. Um, Antihemolytic factor B. Nine, factor nine. Okay, what about uh, fibrin stabilizing factor? This one's, a, this one's a cool one I like. Fibrin stabilizing factor. Factor 13. 13, that's the one where um, a lady gives birth and the umbilicus doesn't, doesn't heal. It, two weeks after childbirth, and her umbilicus is still is still weeping and bleeding. Um, what's another name for um, uh, precalocrine or precalocrine? Make sure you know that. That's um, Fletcher factor. Factor three. Thromboplastin. Not thromboplastin. How about thrombo something else? Thrombokinase. And does anybody know the other name for factor six? That's an easy one. Non-existent. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't exist. So you can rack your brains trying to figure out you know, is that Hageman factor, is that Christmas factor? No, it does, it's not, it's none. It doesn't even exist. Okay. So that's your review for quiz 19 and 20. You'll be getting that tomorrow from Xavier. Good luck on those two quizzes. I'll send you reviews. I'll send you this PowerPoint that I did. Make sure, try to do, try to recreate the um, um Try to recreate the, the PowerPoint, um, not, yeah, uh, the pathway, and um, see if you can do it. Uh, start working on the table. The table is a big table. So, uh, whoops, 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 don't close your eyes. <laughs> um, make sure you um, try, to, try to do the table. And, um, the fiber analytic pathway, again, that one, you're gonna be getting word banks, okay? So good luck on your two quizzes tomorrow and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, you as well, thank you so much. All right, take care everyone. Good evening. All right, bye-bye.